The Chaser Report is recorded on Gadigal land. Striving for mediocrity in a world of excellence, this is The Chaser Report. Hello and welcome to The Chaser Report with Dom and Charles. Hello Charles, there's a problem, there's a big problem and we need to solve it during the course of this podcast. I think we're best placed here, Mm, yes. given our years of comprehensive daily news analysis, to work out how on earth the astronauts stuck on the International Space Station are going to get Mm. back to planet Earth. And when they do get back to planet Earth, we are having the film rights because we're going to solve it. Yes, exactly. That That is our price of solving this crisis for them, is that we get to make the Hollywood remake. Absolutely. And, um, I mean, you know Tom Hanks and, is and probably I, already attached. Well, I kind of think Tom Hanks might be a little bit too alive to star in, in this particular movie. Just saying. Like, I think we, we're going to need someone who's a little bit more dead looking. You don't think we can solve it? Well, I'm just saying. Well, it depends what your definition of solving it means. Because I think I think Boeing thinks that they've actually solved this problem already. The thing is, I'm not sure that solving the problem is going to necessarily mean that the aircraft delivers to live people to yeah. Earth on the 26th of June. It's really important like, to recover corpses after accidents, isn't it, Charles? I don't want to yeah. jump the gun. But if it came to that, that would be success. Let's get into it in a sec. But essentially, one of the reasons why SpaceX is such a successful rocket company is because they their tolerance failure is greater, right? Like I knew a rocket scientist who who told me very directly that you get a lot more data out of a failed launch than you do out of a successful launch. Right. So in that sense, it's it's more of a success if it fails, and this is relevant. Yes. If you haven't seen the story, by the way, um, this Mm. is there are two. Astronauts who are supposed to be coming back uh, on from the International Space Station. Well, no, they're, they're, they're supposed to be already back. Yes, they're supposed to be back already. They're supposed <laughs> to have come back. Uh, it's Barry Butch Wilmore and Sunita Sunny Williams, both American. Mm, yeah. They were supposed to be coming back to, on the uh, 14th of June. Mm, yeah. Then it was postponed yeah. to the 26th. And now yeah. NASA hasn't raised a new date. And the key point that Charles has alluded to already is that they were supposed to come back on the Boeing Starliner, Charles. Ah, yes. All right, let's have some ads because it's classy. Yeah, so um, Boeing running part of your space program. This is part of the, part of the US's much vaunted privatisation of space. And to be fair, NASA was also good at blowing up space shuttles and things you know, when it was publicly run. But I'm not sure mm. the private sector's too much better so far. Well, th- there's a lot of things to unpack here. So the first thing is the whole reason they've given this contract, it's a $3.5 billion contract. The whole reason NASA has given this contract to Boeing is essentially because they're a little bit scared of SpaceX. Yeah, right? I mean, understandably. So, so there's a there's a long-held belief that SpaceX is probably about a decade ahead of everyone else in terms of being able to launch rockets. That includes NASA, like even mm. the sort of publicly funded uh, space organisations are well behind where SpaceX is. And probably about 15 years, uh, Boeing's about 15 years behind SpaceX, right? And But the thing is, when the war in Ukraine started, uh, you know, Starlink, which is, you know, part of the, that SpaceX group yeah, that Elon SpaceX Musk company. runs. Yeah, yeah. So th- that became very useful to supply Wi-Fi to, to the Ukraine. And then uh, at this crucial moment in the war, about a year in, uh, Elon Musk actually just pulled the, the internet coverage for the Ukraine for about 24 hours. And suddenly everyone realised, oh, wait a minute, Elon Musk basically holds the keys to American military power. <laughs> like there, he's, he's actually a sort of non-state actor in the military-industrial complex now. Yes. And, and, but also and, a, a, an incredibly erratic and yes. deeply problematic... I mean, every time I check his... Like, every time I open Twitter, it shows me his tweets, because that's the whole point of Twitter now. And they're all mm. really weird and creepy. We've just learnt over the weekend uh, not only that he's had more children with more employees mm. of SpaceX... But also that um, one of them he propositioned repeatedly, uh, allegedly in California, or it might have been Tesla, one of his companies, uh, and when she said, no, thank you, she got a bad performance evaluation and was denied her bonus. Because that's mm. apparently yeah, what his yeah. company is now. So classy, classy man. Lovely and, man. And, look, and he's got that wonderful thing that a lot of these billionaires get when you become a billionaire, which is this sort of eugenics approach to 
to reproduction. So yeah. he he's actually said openly that he says it is his responsibility to sort of create hundreds of mini Elon Musks using yes. his genes because you know he's got these superior genes uh, and that you know the the world will benefit from having lots of little mini Hitlers running around. Uh, sorry, mini Elon Musks running around um, the planet you know, controlling the satellites of the Ukraine and stuff. Anyway, so very, very nice. But NASA naturally, and the military industrial complex more generally, decided, well, why don't we put our thumb on the scales in this space race? Yeah. And even though Boeing's about 15 years behind, we'll grant this $3.5 billion contract to Boeing and they can create the Starliner. Um, And it can be a a different type of aircraft. It's not like... Mm. uh, those SpaceX rockets, which are designed to sort of go up and down like a shuttle. Yeah, you know, the, like a but they're kind of they, they're amazing. They, they land vertically. I mean, full credit to the mm. landing of those. When they, in the rare, rare occasions when they do, yes. they're very good. Whereas Boeings mm. are Boeings. And that used to mean yeah. something good. Like, you used to get on a Boeing plane mm. and be reassured that the people who made it knew what they were doing. But that time was a long time ago, Charles. Yes, that's right. Because it, back in the early noughties, uh, Boeing was taken over, or maybe it was even the late 90s, Boeing was taken over, well, bought out McDonnell Douglas um, yes. in the mid-1990s, but those executives from McDonnell Douglas who had run McDonnell Douglas into the ground, like the whole reason why yes. um, it was failing was because its planes kept on falling out of the air. Um, and But it was a sort of reverse takeover of Boeing. That, that management culture, mm. which the idea was literally from Jack Welch of General Electric, which was to go in and break things and try and actually stop um, having this culture at Boeing of engineering excellence as the, the raison d'etre to, yeah. to get up in the morning. And Cut costs. Create, yeah. more I mean, there's yeah. a very good episode of last week tonight that goes into great detail on this. But it's essentially, yes, mm. they... <laughs> Made a phenomenal number of people who are in charge of things like, you know, safety and checking things mm. and do the bolts go where they're meant to go? You don't need those, Charles. They're dead weight. Mm. Self-certification mm. Is, is, the, is the key. And then you combine self-certification with this thing that's just emerging and it emerged late last week in Congress where the head of Boeing, the, the current CEO, admitted that there was a culture of retri- retribution against whistleblowers. So mm. say you you know, you know, or one of the subsidiary companies that supply Boeing, like, for example, this uh, place called Sprint, um, they, you know, like a lot of their workers have sort of gone, hang on, you know, there's misaligned bolts and things like that. Like literally, you know, we're supplying bits of aircraft where – you know, the actual holes don't match up with where the bolts are going to go. Yeah. And so, therefore, when they arrive at the Boeing factory and they're misaligned, the the, uh, the the Boeing engineers have to sort of go, okay, well, we'll just drill an extra hole in this, you know, plate or whatever. And and that leads to a whole lot of problems because, actually, you can't just do that. Like, th- these materials have structural integrity, you know, designed into them. And doing that greatly reduces the longevity yeah, of course. and safety of your but aircraft. But also, like, even Tesla has improved this manufacturing processes to the point where they don't have massive gaps in there now. And imagine, mm. are you talking about a, a, something that's supposed to go to space and re-enter mm. through the Earth's atmosphere, which, Charles, I'm no, I'm no astronomer, but doesn't it get really fucking hot and that if things aren't right, you'll just burn to a crisp? Well, I think this is why it's become so interesting, right? So they, so the, this Starliner was very, you know, like it was delayed several times. It was supposed mm. to launch months ago. And by the way, and cost get- overruns of $1.5 billion US dollars on top of the $4.5 billion contract. So it's now... No, but that, that, that's... That's all right. That's all right. You're allowed cost overruns on government contracts. Oh, okay. Is, sorry. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. I forgot. Yeah. yeah. In fact, that, you, you want them, yeah. don't you? Because yeah. you make more money. And in actual fact, Boeing has claimed that it's it's even with all these cost overruns, are not. It's still losing money. <laughs> How do you lose money on a six billion dollar? Well, I, I think no one wants yeah. to buy their planes, Charles, for reasons that yeah. uh, are entirely clear. Yeah. Anyway, what happens is they were trying to launch this a few months ago. They kept on doing things like having helium leaks. And they blamed it on their suppliers. It was like, oh, yeah, these helium links are literally supplied by the same people, Sprint, who designed the door that you know flew out of that Airbus, like, out of that out of the um, 737 MAX. Like literally, they are the, you know, it's, 
it's that sort it's of, a space seven three seven yeah. max is what it is. And you know, and remember, you know, if you speak up about it, if you're a whistleblower, you speak up about it, you end up dead, right? So you know, well, there's no culture of like, you know, well, you end up going. having to fly on Boeing. I think they make you do the test <laughs> missions, <laughs> yeah. which is yeah, that, that's their form of retribution. Anyway, so then finally, even though um, just recently, like in early June, they la- they decided that we're going to go ahead anyway. There was definitely helium leaks on the launch pad. They went, doesn't matter, it'll we'll sort it out. They get up there, they go, surprise, surprise, the helium's still leaking from their propulsion systems. Now, what this means is the reason why they have helium there is to actually create extra pressure in their fuel systems, right? And so all that helium's just leaked out into space. And so they got up there and they realised they didn't have the propulsion necessary to dock with the International Space Station. So it was like it was sluggish. It was sort of like, you know, you're in second gear. You're wanting to be mm. in fifth gear and, you know, racing towards the thing. You can't quite make You know, in The Martian, how, you know, they he gets launched very unrealistically up in the air. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, the... The flap, you know, like the whole thing is flapping in the wind and it creates this thing and it's sluggish, right? That's what's happened to this Starliner. So they finally managed to dock it with the International Space Station. Two astronauts who are on the Boeing <coughs> immediately hop off, not least because there's no fucking toilet on this fucking Boeing Starliner. It's got six it, billion dollars. It's a capsule. They don't even... Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. it's a tiny it's, um, capsule and, the, and they, yeah. every time there's um, they go up again, they have to have a new whole kind of rocket on the back of it so it's basically like a little pod for all yes. these billions of dollars no no but then no but then now the point is there's two of those astronauts who are on the space station are now due to come down now i think that the point is that's not necessarily the people who are launched up there is it, it it's actually two other people who are now going to come down right talk about drawing the short straw like you know like <laughs> Which rocket are we going to get you down on? You know, normally it'd be a NASA rocket or a SpaceX rocket or something like that. And and so, oh, by the way, uh, we've got this experimental Boeing uh, capsule to uh, to send you down on. Is that right? It Am is. I right the, about it's the that? same people. The same people. Oh, it's the same people. <clears throat> okay, right. Now, so they're, they're bunking up there. They've got 45 days to solve it because the whole problem is um, they've only got 45 days worth of uh, fuel and fuel. Food for, for this everyone. is why it's going to be such a great movie, yes, Charles. Yes, you're right. There's 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 the time pressure. There's the race against time to fix it. So, but you know what they've done? The way they've solved the helium thing is they tore up the computer code that deter- like the holds the you know helium capsules, like the code, the, mm. and they just rewrote <clears throat> the whole code. Imagine being the coder who has to sort of come up with a new computer program to make a fucking but, Boeing aircraft work. But again, this is a thing that happens in a movie. So you go, like, you've got yes. a geeky dude, whatever, who, who's got no yes. social life, and you're going, fix it, and you shout at yes. them, and then and then they fix it. Yeah. Um, and well, you put a gun to their head. and then they You do. Coding. Now, Charles, yeah, while yeah, you've yeah. been telling this story, I have solved the problem. I've actually oh, solved... Okay. I have. I've, I have yep. truthfully solved the problem. Uh, I'll explain why in a moment. And also, I want to explain why those two astronauts are incredibly brave. Right, okay. The Chaser Report. More news. Less often. I'm just looking at the history of the Starliner on Wikipedia, Charles. I must say, the two astronauts who went on board these things are either very brave or deeply stupid because they have had so many problems with this thing. Mm, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just looking back, it was supposed to be launched in 2017. Then they screwed around until 2023 with all these problems. Then on June the 1st last year, they announced the flight was delayed due to a problem with a parachute harness and flammable tape on the wiring. Then they said, oh, in August, that's oh, fine. We'll fix the pl- ta- flammable tape by September, and then in November, we'll try and get the harness right. Then in May of this year, it was supposed to go up, but there was a problem with the oxygen valve, so they cancelled that two hours before launch. Then they had all these helium problems, which have been dating back to the start of May. Then on the 1st of June, they tried to um, launch the thing, right? So presumably the astronauts are sitting there ready to go. It was aborted yep. three minutes and 50 seconds before liftoff. And then four yep. days later, it actually went again. I mean, the writing was on the wall that going up mm. in this thing was not a very sensible idea. It's held together also, by duct tape. It, it, duct tape you know, would be an improvement on what they've done because one of the fascinating things to me is, so they realised the parachutes didn't work, right, and kept on catching on fire because this 
ta- like the tape was too flammable, right? This was this is like last year. Yeah. And then they solved the problem at the beginning of this year, right? And they and it's not just one parachute, right? Like there's um seven parachutes. There's two forward heat shield parachutes, two drogue parachutes, three pilot mortar parachutes, right? Main canopy. Mm. So they sent it up sent up a test flight uh to test it out without any humans on it. They do it. Only two of the seven parachutes succeeded. And then the Boeing engineers turned around and went, Okay, well that'll that's, that's enough. enough. Yep. That's but, enough. But, you know, so this is like the old this is like the old pre space shuttle. Like the space shuttle the whole point with it was that it sort of took off and landed in a predictable way and you could keep reusing it. This thing's is like a, a, a moon landing style pod that splashes down with parachutes. Yes, if the parachutes yes. don't work, not yes. only are the people on board presumably going to very much die, but you've got yes. a projectile raining from space at high speed that could mm. hit anything, presumably, on Ooh, the planet. That's a good, that's the Act it. 3. That's the, that's that's the, the Act, Act 3 twist. Yeah. Three. You realise suddenly it doesn't become a movie about saving the craft. No, because you can't. It's because you can't. It's like, where's it going to hit? It's like saving saving the city from, you know, it'll be projected that it's going to hit the most populated place in America, Times Square. Oh, no. And they'll just divert it so it crashes into the Hudson. And then the hero, the hero gets what we'll do is, no, no, they'll get like, get everyone to make, you know, um, slime or something in their backyard oh. and haul it into Times Square and create some sort of trampoline style. I'm thinking a mega trampoline is, is what you mega want. Mega trampoline. Oh, you're right. Or, or into the Hudson. Yeah, We're going to pour all the baking soda and corn flour that we've got into the Hudson and and make it so that they can land safely. I've got okay. it. I've got it, Charles. Yep. It's New York City. If there's one thing New York City is fav- famous for, it's those mm. very thin, oversized pizzas. I'm imagining yes. the biggest pizza are ever Pizza. made and and yeah and all the they just bounce it up <laughs> and absorb the heat and yeah. then at the end at the end they come out of the capsule and go that's some tasty pizza. Um, and it'd be like New York original pizza saves the day. But I have <laughs> I mean the merchandising. Oh, the, the merchandising. The merchandising would be amazing. But Charles, I have yeah. solved this while we've been speaking. Okay. Yeah, do, you know, sorry, do you know what yes. I've done? What? I've tweeted Elon Musk and I've said, Hey Elon Musk, you saving those astronauts yet, bro. He will yeah. see that. And because yes. you know he loves a rescue mission. We know this from the cave yes, with the mini submarine. Yes. He loves yep. a high profile rescue mission. He's yep. going to send up, I and mean, what a fantastic chance to just yep. really one up the, fe- the federal government, Boeing, and everyone yep. else, and call everyone pedophiles, which he loves doing. Well, um, and the thing is, what will happen is presumably the astronauts won't refuse. The lift down on the SpaceX thing. No, for fear for fear of being accused of being a pedophile. That's right. That's right. That yeah. is definitely. <laughs> that's right. They won't make that mistake again. Yeah, absolutely. Um. Yeah. So that's so I've solved it. So it's good. It's it's going to happen. Elon will see this and go, oh, okay, and probably just start a whole other business, the space rescues or something. But yeah, Charles, yeah, yeah. I'm just looking more about this at the Starliner and just how wild this this thing is. Yeah. Um. Do you know that as part of their deal with NASA for this thing? Mm. Yeah. Is that they're allowed to send up a tourist in future missions to the ISS? Oh my god. At least god. in twenty fourteen. Their contract was Boeing can price and sell passage to low Earth orbit using the one space tourist seat. So that these poor astronauts trying to do their job are gonna have to deal yeah. with one rich asshole yes. on every flight. It's gonna be like the Titan submersible. <laughs> <laughs> it's got real Stockton Rush vibes. It does. This story, doesn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Yeah. So there's that. That's yeah. a stupid idea. And then here's yeah. a far stupider idea. Yep. Um, they want to use this whole thing as part of a tourist space station. Oh, wow. They're going to build a new... They're going to build a tourist space what, station. What brand is it? Is it like a fancy brand, or is it like an Ibis space hotel? Like what? <laughs> what, what are we thinking? Is it like Sofitel or? It's probably going to be a casino, isn't it? Yes, I'm sure it'll be a casino. It, it'll be called the Big Bang Burger Bar. The Big Bang Burger Bar. <laughs> <laughs> nice little callback there. Um, yeah, so mm. they're partnering with Blue Origin. Uh, on this, another highly speculative space outfit, along with um, Sierra Nevada Corporation. It's going to be called the Orbital Reef. It's going to be a mixed-use business park, is the theory. And um, supposedly Starline is going to be ferrying people to and from this fun Orbital Reef space station. It's like, it's like this is like um, what the, the, 
Saudi Arabian uh, yes. n- norm thing. Neom. 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 It's space in, Neom. Neom on space. In space. It's extraordinary. Amazon wow. Web Services are going to be involved in supporting it. What's the tax rate up there? I think I, that, I isn't imagine, that the idea? Yeah. You'd be very... Offshore is no longer the trendiest way to dodge tax. So, this, well, that's Jeff Bezos is basically doing this. So... He's setting up a space tax haven for himself, presumably. You know what? You know the way to do it is to not to save on having to get the price of the fare to go up there. Yeah, is what you do is you order something on Amazon and say that that's the address, and then oh, and they'll then deliver put, it, and then deliver it, but hop in the box before they deliver it. Oh, good and idea. Then you get, you get a free ride. And I'm looking at this. It's going to be able to dock with every <laughs> every different company. And it's being made, the people who designed the habitat, it's called Bigelow Aerospace. Like it literally surely juice Bigelow gonna, in space. No one, no one is going to use it. Not if it's got a Boeing. It's like it's, no one's going to go up there. Well, no, but except the SpaceX. The SpaceX will be able to go up there. And also, yeah, fun, yeah, funnily exactly. enough, the Russian Soyuz, which um, by virtue of being entirely space, entirely state run, actually works. So the Russians will be able to dock there as well. So this is the future. Jeff Bezos is going to be living presumably on this space station in uh, on this Blue Origin orbital reef thing. And um, that will finally... I mean, all the billionaires will live in space. Uh, we can only hope that Boeing is the one that ferries them up and down because the chances of an amazing catastrophe are considerably higher if Boeing's involved. It's extraordinary because the international... I was just reading, the, the International Space Station cost $100 billion to build. Like... How are they going to make their money back on that? Like, what's the cost of a night at the reef or the orbital or whatever it's called? Well, at orbital like, reef. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. But Charles, I honestly think this is part of the funding model because people love space disaster movies. I think that the oh, movie that's going to be yes. made, part of that money yes. will go towards it, the rights for the disaster. But yes. I just think, I just hope that the two astronauts have very good life insurance <laughs> um, because they're they're going to be immortalised um, yes. posthumously in a very short period of time. Do you think you can just say, uh, can you miss your flight? Like, Oh, yes. What a good idea. One of those sorts of things where it's like, oops, sorry, I'll have to get the next one down. I, that's what I do. I, yeah. You know what I'd be doing if I was them right now? You'd, be... trick, you'd trick one of the other astronauts to put themselves on standby. Oh, that's, that's good. <laughs> or, don't you just pretend you've got COVID, like cough and... Oh, oh, yeah. <coughs> oh, can't I can't possibly oh, go. No, I can't yeah, do it. Can't travel. Sorry, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll, you have to get someone yeah. else to do it. Yeah. Just amazing. This is going to be a very morbid episode in a few days, isn't it? But, but this yeah. is the great thing. We've got it in beforehand. It's yes. just it's cynical speculation about corporations' insensitivity to human life. It's not us that's insensitive, Charles. No, it's the corporations. Yeah, yeah. I blame capitalism. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> late capitalism. Late is in deceased. Yeah. Our gear is from Road. We're part of the Iconoclast Network. Uh, we'll ke- keep you up to date with this about-to-be-breaking story. I think it is going to break on up in, on re-entry, yes. A breaking-up story, yeah.